Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. I just wanted to reiterate an announcement, or actually to make an announcement. Uh, we're having the movie Overcomer uh, this Wednesday at 6 o'clock. And it's a great movie. It really, um, it's a Christian movie. And it uh, really strengthened my faith. And uh, it's something that the whole family can enjoy. And um, you can have popcorn and uh, soda. And anyone who wants to help, you know, just let me know after church. And uh, I've invited the community, so we'll see who comes. Amen? Amen. And then on the 26th, we're having our car wash, our annual car wash. We had one last year, it was a lot of fun. Uh, again, same thing. Uh, it's from 10 to 2 on Saturday the 26th. And you're all welcome to come, and anyone who wants to help out, let me know too. At this time, please stand for the call to worship. Lord, help us to undress ourselves. Lord, help us to come to you as humbly as we know how. Lord, help us to give up all pretenses. And please remain standing for the gathering here. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, number 15. Father God, we invite you into this service today. We ask you to fill us with a sense of awe and gratitude, to remind ourselves that we are nothing without you. Help us to give up all pretenses regarding our possessions, our spiritual gifts, and our achievements. Strip us down to our bare souls and help us to stand naked before you. And we say together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Jesus came into this world so that we could be forgiven for our sins. Let us confess them now freely. All together, Father, we confess our sins this morning, our sin of thinking we are anything apart from you. Help us to humble ourselves as we have never been humbled before, to stand naked and bow down before you, a holy God, to revere you with amazement that you have created our very souls, and to know that our lives are completely and entirely in your loving hand. God knows our hearts and our spirits. God sees our struggles and forgives our weaknesses. Know that it is in God's healing love that you live and move and have your being. Rejoice, for God is with you always. Please remain seated for the hymn, There is Lord Jesus, number 227. <laughs> Let us pray. Giving honor to God who was the head of my life, to all of you who came out to hear a word from the Lord today. Lord, we ask you to bless this sermon, pour down your wisdom from heaven, remove everything that is in Daniel, and let your spirit shine through. Bless the ears that hear it. In Jesus' name, amen. As I made abundantly clear when I preached last week, last Sunday was a very special day on this earth for everybody in the world because it was my 60, 61st birthday. A birthday I celebrated in part by spending time alone with God in prayer in the sanctuary of the church where my psychotherapy office is located. And there God revealed to me the subject of today's sermon. As I prayed, I realized that while I had many hopes and dreams for the future, I would be okay even if none of them came to pass. That my love for God was so strong, I would be grateful to Him, even if He took away my pastorship, my family, my home, my car, my clothes, everything. 
That is, if God left me destitute, I would still worship him. That, as Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Church, there are three things God has told me since I became a pastor. One, you are not alone. Two, I called you. And three, trust me. The first one was what he revealed to me when I first got hired at CCB and looked up to see you are not alone carved in wood atop the mailboxes near the exit. The second was a voice I heard late at night when I was grappling with some issue related to the church. And God reminded me that it was he who called me to pastor rather than it being something I just wanted on my own. And the third message came as I spent several hours in prayer in this very sanctuary one Saturday when God told me in a still small voice, trust me. While your journey is not the same as mine, I believe we can all learn from these three messages. That we all need to know that we are not alone, but that God is with us, that he is all-knowing, all-powerful, and everywhere. That we all need to know that God has called each of us to do a work on this earth. And that we all need to trust him. Can I get my first amen? amen? Because in the end, the only thing we can count on in this life is that we will be conscious until the day we die. Our families, our gifts, our accomplishments, even the use of our bodies, all of these can be taken away from us in an instant. But this is not cause for alarm. For I'm not saying that God will take all his blessings away. But until we are okay with the fact that all of these things can be taken away from us, until we know that we are completely and utterly helpless without God's blessing, until we offer God everything we have on the altar, we will never know what it is to be poor in spirit. My favorite author, Michael Singer, says that, quote, everything will be okay as soon as you are okay with everything, and that's the only time everything will be okay. Well, I agree with him, but with the twist that we as Christians know that the only way for us to be okay with everything is to tell God that we can do, that we can do without all of his blessings, but that we can't do without him. It is humbling, is it not, to realize how little we truly control on this earth. That while we can do many things that will increase our odds that life will work out for us, things God wants us to do, like eating right and working hard at our jobs, the only thing we ultimately have control of is not life itself, but how we react to it inside of our heads. Way back in 1973, in the movie Magnum Force, Clint Eastwood famously declared, a man's got to know his limitations. Recognizing our limitations when it comes to us and God is key to becoming, as the first beatitude in the Gospel of Matthew states, poor in spirit. Ourselves, stripped naked of all our possessions, of all our relationships, of all our gifts, of all our accomplishments. To humble ourselves before the Almighty God who created us in His image. This is what it means to be poor in spirit. And the good news, I said the good news is that Matthew 5 and 3 promises us that if we humble ourselves this way, if we become paupers in God's eyes, if we truly allow ourselves to be poor in spirit, then ours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Perhaps not coincidentally, I recently started reading a book called The Kingdom Focused Church by Pastor Gene Mims, where he stated that the kingdom of heaven is not for the future up in heaven, but to be experienced right here on earth. That we are supposed to be living our best lives and enjoying God's grace right here and now. 
And as the scripture I just quoted in Matthew tells us, the key to experiencing the kingdom of heaven here on earth is to be poor in spirit. And poor in spirit is the same thing as being humble. A favorite topic of mine as I devoted over a dozen years researching her. She, humility is a beautiful word, too beautiful to be a he. I said she teaches us three important lessons. One, to put ourselves in perspective by not thinking too high, too low, or too often of ourselves. Two, to accept all of those things in life that we don't like but cannot change. That is, to learn to be okay with as much as we can stand and then be okay with ourselves when we can't stand anymore. And three, to look at the glass as half full rather than half empty, giving thanks for all of our blessings. Thus, humility, or being poor in spirit, leads us to a world where we commune with God and give back to God by worshiping Him and reading His Word and obeying His commandments to the best of our abilities. We also commune with our fellow travelers on this journey called life, loving them as we learn to love ourselves and to learn to be okay with not being okay to learn to accept ourselves even when we miss the mark and stubbornly refuse to be okay because something happened we just couldn't accept and we choose to make ourselves miserable with fear, anger, guilt, or shame, wallowing in these negative emotions like a pig in mud. You see, church, when we bow low before God on the altar and allow Him to strip us down to our very soul, we realize with amazement that we love God so much, we will trust Him even if He slays us. That is, if in God's infinite wisdom, He chooses to take us off the battlefield just when we are about to have our greatest triumph, we will still love Him for all of our earthly possessions, even our bodies, belong to Him and Him alone. It's interesting that one of the quotes I used to start this sermon comes from Job. Now the story of Job is exactly that of a man who had everything taken away from him, yet trusted God throughout. And in the end, after being stripped of his wealth, his family, and even his health, Job wound up with twice as much wealth, twice as big a family, and a healthy body to boot. The moral of the story being to trust God and He will bless you. Think of all the blessings we take for granted. Being poor in spirit allows you to be grateful for the most basic things, such as the food on your table or the breath in your body. Self-help guru Tony Robbins talks about two men he met at one of his motivational seminars. One said he was miserable because he only made two million dollars a year instead of five million. The other said every day above ground is a good day. There's nothing wrong with making money, but how many of you know that greed will never be satisfied? But if you're grateful every day you're above ground, every day is a good day. I once sang in a choir with a man who when asked if he ever had any bad days, responded, Bad days? Bad days? I might have some bad moments, but bad days? Never. Church, sometimes I'm tempted to complain about financial issues. That while I live in a beautiful house and drive a Lexus, I haven't amassed a small fortune on which to retire. Then the other day, while talking to a friend who is a self-admitted workaholic and has amassed a small fortune, I discovered that his relationships with his nuclear family were, well, nuclear, with everyone throwing nukes at each other, one sort or another. And right then, I pinched myself and counted my blessings. But while my family is not perfect, next to his, my family is the friggin' Waltons. <laughs> I mean, the love we have for each other is real, and it's like living in Mr. Rogers' neighborhood with a dash of tropical spice for my wife to keep things interesting. 
So while I don't have the retirement income I would like to have, I must remind myself of some very pleasant facts. The fact that I have two professions, pastoring and psychotherapy, where I get to help others. That I have a family and church family that loves me, and that my relationship with God is rock solid and growing stronger every day. That my writing sermons and books about humility and life is a path of heart. That while they won't make me a billionaire, I couldn't be happier in my choice of professions. The glass is way more than half full. It is truly a good season. And not all seasons in my life have been good, but this is a particularly good one. And it's one that should get better and better until my body starts to decay. Something that should be true for all of us. You see, church, if you're learning the lessons life has to teach you, and you are careful to let God lead you and stay on a path with heart, you will grow each day, each week, each month, each year. For you will learn to count your blessings with thankfulness, and you will figure out clever ways to avoid or accept things you don't like, and to accept yourself when you can't do that properly. With enough wisdom and humility, you will see life as a series of challenges, not problems. And when you are poor in spirit and not too attached to your desires, you can look at the trials in your life the way a surfer looks at the waves. To be excited about your trials, knowing that God knows all about them and will see, them, see you through them uh, gloriously. For when you are poor in spirit, you are indestructible. Indestructible because you know that even if those waves wash everything away that you hold dear, they cannot touch your soul. Can I get an amen, church? Amen. amen. And as I close, I'm here to tell you not to wait until God takes anything away from you. To humble yourself before him and tell him you love him so much that you come before him as a naked soul. Throw out your degrees, your job title, the good you do on this earth. In the end, these are all gifts from God. Tell the gift giver you love him and will love him even if he takes all those gifts away. But while we, he won't strip us naked while we live, he will do it the day we die. And then we will stand naked before him and profess our love. And if you don't want to hear him say, I never knew you, you'll be wise and strip yourself naked before him and express that love while you still have all your possessions and abilities and a healthy body. Church, God wants to hear it. Right now, he is asking you personally to strip yourself down to your soul. To strip yourself down of all you hold dear and to sit before the Lord as nothing more than the bare soul. Can I get my final amen, church? Right now, there might be one who does not know Christ, or one who feels they have backslidden and want to reestablish their relationship with God. If that's you, I want you to know that Jesus is waiting, that God loves you. If you feel called to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior today, just repeat after me. Lord, I am a sinner in need of salvation. I turn my life over to you. I believe you are the Son of God and that you died on the cross for my sins and were resurrected on the third day, conquering death and hell. If that was you and you're here in the service, I ask you to speak with me after service. And finally, if there's anyone here who does not have a church home and wants to join this body of believers, if that's you, I ask you to speak with one of the deacons after church service is over. God bless you all. And at this time, please stand for the closing hymn, Peace, in the white hymnal number 80. Lord, we thank you for allowing us to come and worship you today. 
We ask you to bless each and every one of us, Lord. Help us to know that you are everything and that we are nothing without you. Help us, Lord, to be blessed, Lord, as only you can bless us, Lord, with a love, Lord, that is perfect. Lord, keep us this week and help us, Lord, to share our life with someone in need. In Jesus' name, amen. Nick Augustino right here at the East Side Restaurant. We always have the complete full dinner menu. Knockwurst, bratwurst, sour broughton, potato pancakes, red cabbage, rice pudding, cream pies, all the desserts that Germany had to offer. I always do something different. Yes, I do. I brought seafood to the beer garden at the East Side Restaurant. East Side Restaurant, your German destination restaurant in Connecticut. Tiggy talking, tiggy talking, hoi, hoi, hoi. I'm your host, Kurt Barwis. Today, I have a very special guest, Dr. Andrew Lynn. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Veterans Corner. My name is Chuck Wooden. Decision for ourselves for this week if we want to be made well. Hi, welcome to the crack of dawn. It's Dawn Lombardi. I'm starting the painting. It's going to be the clips with some water. Love it. He took me on the sets of Lost in Space, Batman. Everybody has a story. What's yours? Until next time.